At the beginning of the 20th century, African Americans owned at least 14 million acres of land. By the 21st century, 90% of the land had been stolen from them. Now, African Americans only own 1.1 million acres of farmland and are part owners of another 1.07 million acres. Across a century, white farmers and landowners developed multiple ways to take African Americans' land using methods such as violence, heirs' property, tax sales, and Torrens Acts. Of all these, the Heirs' Property Act is still in force today, as black owners lose every source of wealth they've created for generations. To understand the magnitude of this land theft, we must examine the extreme measures taken by those who captured the land from African American landowners. Both laws and practices allowed white landowners, farmers, and developers to manipulate the system so they could gain control over the land owned by African American farmers and homeowners. In this video, we are going to take a look at the four ways black Americans were robbed of their land and how these robberies still occurs today. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. Untold numbers of black Americans became landowners following the Civil War when the government handed over some 20 million acres, mostly in the South under the Homestead Act. These property holdings could have provided a foundation for black wealth building in post-Jim Crow America. Instead, they became a source of riches for others. Rather than helping to close the racial wealth gap, blacks' land holdings became a key force in widening it as white people and officials used four extreme measures to steal and claim black land. Number one, violence. With black people getting richer and owning more property than ever before, Jealous white folks sought to using violence and deadly force to enforce the idea of white supremacy. The Tuskegee Institute and the National ASSN for the advancement of colored people have documented more than 3,000 lynchings between 1865 and 1965. Many of those lynched were landowners and the goal behind them was to bring an end to black wealth, take black land, and uphold white supremacy. These lynchings were not only done by ordinary white people, but some white officials condoned the violence. Several of them added threats of their own. James K. Vardaman, who was governor of Mississippi from 1904 to 1908, was quoted saying, if it is necessary, every Negro in the state will be lynched. With the start of these lynchings, mostly single families were targeted. However, in some cases, entire black communities were destroyed. The racial cleansing of Forsyth County, Georgia in 1912 and the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 are some of the most significant examples. Today, Birmingham, Kentucky lies under a floodway created in the 1940s. This town was destroyed by the creation of Kentucky Lake. But at the start of the 20th century, it was a tobacco center with a predominantly black population and a battleground in a five-year siege by white marauders called Night Riders. On the night of March 8, 1908, about 100 armed whites tore through town on horseback, shooting seven blacks, three of them fatally. The press documented the cases of 14 black landowners who were driven from Birmingham. Together, they lost more than 60 acres of farmland and 21 city lots to whites, many at sheriff's sales, all for low prices. John Scruggs and his granddaughter were killed in Birmingham that night. Property records show that the lot Scruggs had bought for $25 in 1902 was sold for non-payment of taxes six years after the attack. A white man bought it for $7.25, about $144 in today's dollars. Land that had belonged to other blacks went for even less. John Puckett's two acres sold for $4.70 while Ben Kelly's city lot went for $2.60. In Pierce City, Missouri, 1,000 armed whites burned down five black-owned houses and killed four blacks on August 18, 1901. Within days, all of the town's 129 blacks had fled, never to return. According to the Associated Press, nine Pierce City blacks would lose a total of 30 acres of farmland and 10 city lots. Whites would go on to buy it all at bargain prices. In the case of Eveline Brinson, whose house was burned down by the mob, she would sell her lot for $25 to a white woman after the attack. The attacks on Birmingham and Pierce City were part of a pattern in southern and border states in the first half of the 20th century. Lynchings and mob attacks on blacks, followed by an exodus of black citizens some of them forced to abandon their property or sell it at cut-rate prices. Black landowners were put under a tremendous amount of pressure from authorities and otherwise to give up their land and leave. They became refugees in their own country. 
For example, the Associated Press found that 18 black families lost a total of 330 acres plus 48 city lots when they fled Ocoee, Florida after a 1920 Election Day attack on the black community. According to property records, some were able to sell their land at a fair price, but others such as Valentine Hightower were not. He parted with 52 acres for $10 in 1926. Today, the land lost by the 18 Ocoee families, not including buildings now on it, is assessed at more than $4.2 million. Sometimes individual black farmers were singled out and attacked by bands of white farmers known as the White Caps. Operating in several southern and border states around the turn of the 20th century, they were intent on driving blacks from their land and discouraging other blacks from acquiring it. White Caps often nailed notes with crudely drawn coffins to the doors of black landowners, warning them to leave or die. The warning to Eli Hilson of Lincoln County, Mississippi, came on November 18, 1903, when White Caps shot up his house. However, Hilson ignored the warning. A month later, the 39-year-old farmer was shot dead as he drove his buggy toward his farm. The horse pulling the buggy trotted home, delivering Hilson's body to his wife, Hannah. She struggled to rear their 11 children and worked the 74-acre farm, but she could not manage without her husband. She lost the property through a mortgage foreclosure in 1905. Land records show the farm went for over $400 to S.P. Oliver, a county supervisor. Today, the property is assessed at over $60,000. It wasn't just whitecaps and night riders who chased blacks from their land. Sometimes officials did it. In Yazoo County, Mississippi, Norman Stevens and his twin brother Homer ran a trucking business, hauling cotton pickers to plantations. Stevens' widow, Rosie Fields, would reveal the harrowing story that unfolded years later. One day in 1950, a white farmer demanded that Stevens immediately deliver workers to his field. Stevens explained he had other commitments and promised to drop off the men later, however. The farmer fetched the sheriff. That evening, the brothers found themselves locked in a second-floor room at the county jail. They squeezed through a window, leaped to the ground, and ran. Fields said her husband later told her why. They had overheard the sheriff, now dead, talking about where to hide their bodies. Fields said Stevens and his brother quickly flagged down a bus to Ohio. A year later, she and her five children joined them. For a decade, the family made mortgage and property tax payments on the house they left behind. Records show. But it was hard to keep up, and they never dared to return, Fields said. Finally, in the 1960s, they stopped paying and lost the house they had purchased for $700 in 1942. One of the most brutal cases of racial violence to claim black land was the story of Anthony Crawford. Crawford was a rich black American who inherited farmable land on his father's death which he increased by substantial land purchases in 1883, 1888, 1899, and 1903. In the mid or late 1890s, Crawford was co-founder of the Industrial Union of Abbeville County, which was devoted to the material, moral, and intellectual advance of the colored people. He was also the father of 12 sons and four daughters. Crawford was without doubt one of the richest men in Abbeville County. However, his prosperity had made him a target. The success of blacks such as Crawford threatened the reign of white supremacy, as at that time there were obvious limitations or ceilings that blacks weren't supposed to go beyond. For many decades, successful blacks lived with a gnawing fear that white neighbors could at any time do something violent and take everything from them. That day would come for Crawford, leading to this untimely demise. On October 21, 1916, Crawford was taking two loads of cotton and a load of seed into Abbeville and had a disagreement over the price of cottonseed with W.D. Barksdale, a white store owner. Barksdale offered Crawford 85 cents a pound for his cottonseed. Crawford replied that he had a better offer. Barksdale called him a liar. Crawford called the storekeeper a cheat. Three clerks grabbed axe handles and Crawford backed into the street, where Sheriff Burtz appeared and arrested Crawford for cursing a white man. Crawford was held at the jail briefly and released later that day on $1.15 bail. While Crawford was arranging bail, Barksdale was organizing a mob with McKinney Can to whip Crawford and cure him if possible. Sheriff Burtz allowed Crawford to exit from a side door, but the mob saw him anyway and pursued him into a cotton mill nearby, where Crawford took shelter in the boiler room. McKinney Can entered the boiler room after Crawford, and Crawford, grabbing a hammer from some nearby tools, knocked the man unconscious. 
Although the mill workers attempted to stop it, Crawford was stabbed and severely beaten by the mob. Sheriff Burtz appeared and arrested Crawford once more, much to the chagrin of the mob of whites. The sheriff could only get Crawford away from the mob by promising to the brothers of Can that he would not try to sneak Crawford out of town before the full extent of McKinney Can's injuries was known. As it happened, Can was not badly hurt, although Crawford was. He was treated by physician C.C. Gamble, who also happened to be the mayor of Abbeville. Gamble announced that Crawford would likely die from his wounds. Considering that Crawford might die before the mob could get to him, and concerned that the sheriff might spirit him out of town at 3 p.m., around 200 white men besieged the jail, captured and disarmed Sheriff Burtz, and abducted Crawford. Crawford was dragged down three flights of stairs amongst a cheering, bloodthirsty mob, where they proceeded to beat him with rocks, wagon boards, jump and spit on him. The mob then dragged him through the black section of town with a rope around his neck as a warning. They then stole a lumber wagon from a black driver and used it to take Crawford to a fairground nearby. Crawford, likely dead by that point, was still hung from a tree, and armed whites riddled his body with bullets, rendering it to a bloody pulp by the bloodthirsty white mob that resented his wealth. The paper's headline the next day read, Negro strung up and shot to pieces. To hide the truth, the county coroner reported that Crawford had died at the hands of parties unknown. That night, the relentless mob decided they needed to drive Crawford's children and their families from the area. On October 23, 1916, the white citizens of Abbeville, including many members of the lynch mob, voted to expel the remainder of Crawford's family from South Carolina and to seize their considerable property holdings. They also voted to close down all the black-owned businesses in Abbeville. The Crawfords requested they be given until the November 15th, and it was granted they were to leave by mid-November. They did indeed leave, leaving behind their family's generational assets. Number two, tax sale. The next method used to scheme black people out of their land was tax sales. Tax sales were a way that the land could be taken from its owners and auctioned off. White tax assessors routinely overvalued black-owned land, forcing black property owners to bear a heavier tax burden than whites and slowly draining families of earnings. If black-owned property became valuable or a black property owner challenged white supremacy, Local officials could simply declare the property tax delinquent and sell it at a tax sale. In these cases, black people would want to stay on their land instead of selling it, but most of them lived on a fixed income. Consequently, many of these homeowners eventually found themselves unable to afford their annual property taxes. Once they were in default, the county would put the property up for auction. This was something that developers used as an advantage when they wanted to access land families didn't want to sell. The story of Evelina Jenkins, a black South Carolina Sea Islands native, offers a case in point. She owned dozens of acres of property, including an entire island, at a time in the early 1970s when land values along the state's coastline were skyrocketing. As a result of the state's pitiful expenditures on colored schools, Miss Jenkins had received only minimal education and never learned to read. Decades of disfranchisement and white control of local government and the courts had taught her that whatever rights and protections it afforded did not apply to her. Even venturing inside the local government offices where people registered for licenses or paid their taxes was an invitation to be mistreated and humiliated and was something to avoid. So Miss Jenkins entrusted a white neighbor who had befriended her to take her annual property tax payments to town for her. But rather than submitting Miss Jenkins's payments, he pocketed them, then waited for her taxes to fall delinquent, whereupon he bought the lien to her property at the county's annual tax auction. Then, after the statutory redemption window closed, he gained title to her land holdings, island and all, which he subsequently resold to a developer. In the decades since, the land Jenkins once owned has generated untold amounts of wealth. Houses on the island she once owned today sell for upward of $400,000. Miss Jenkins, though, never saw a dime of it. Rather than leave her children an ample inheritance, she died penniless, forced to live out her last days in her daughter's mobile home. While Miss Jenkins' case was particularly egregious, the legal theft of black land in similar ways was not uncommon. In booming real estate markets like Hilton Head and surrounding Sea Islands, tax sales afforded investors a lucrative opportunity to acquire valuable property for pennies on the dollar. Number three, Torrens Acts. A third method was called the Torrens Acts. 
The Torrens Axe was based off of the Torrens Systems, which was first used 1858 in Australia. It was developed by Sir Robert Torrens for the purpose of enhancing the certainty of title to land and to simplify dealings involving land. When introduced in the United States, the Torrens Act was supposed to be used to simplify title registry. Instead, it became a loophole that allowed third parties to forcibly remove families from their property through partition sales. Partition sales take place when one of a property's owners wants to sell, but the others don't. The Torrens Act and related rules allowed sales to take place without the notification of family members or other co-owners of the land. Once the sale was made, the rules associated with the Torrens Act protected the buyer from any legal recourse by the owners who did not know about or agree to the sale. Number four, heirs' property. While there were several ways people were allowed to take land differed by state, with each having its own approach to scheme black people out of their land, heirs' property was a method used across all of them. Heirs' property generally refers to family-owned property inherited by multiple generations without the formal legal proceedings necessary to prove ownership. Without probate proceedings at an owner's death, heirs may possess the property, but they lack the clear title necessary to prove their ownership status. This means they may not be able to sell the property, use the property as collateral for financing, or receive USDA benefits for farming activities conducted on the property. It also means they may be at a greater risk of losing the property through a partition action or because they fail to pay their property taxes. Over generations, the number of owners would become substantial. This created challenges for the landowners. It eventually became easy enough for other people to come in and take control of the land, especially when every family member could not be found to seek permission for selling the land. So even if some members of the family wanted to keep the land, other members could choose to sell it. White developers would end up preying on family miscommunication and taking control of the land. These partition sales invariably resulted in the land being sold at well below its market value, enriching the buyer while leaving the displaced and dispossessed family members with nothing. Speculators have used this legal trick to force the sale of millions of acres of black-owned land over the past several decades. Only in the past couple of years have some states begun to adopt a uniform law designed to curb the most predatory abuses of heirs' property laws. However, much of the damage has been done. The cumulative effect of these methods used over a century to steal land or otherwise manipulate families out of their land was devastating. In Mississippi alone, the land stolen from 1950 to 1964 totaled up to 800,000 acres. A research team calculated the value of the stolen land in Mississippi to be $3.7 billion to $6.6 .6 billion in today's dollars. And these estimates of white wealth extraction from African Americans through land theft are just one state. Today in the U.S., 43.4% of black Americans are homeowners, compared with 72.1% of white people, 51.1% of the Latina population, and 53% of AAPI, indigenous or other. Home ownership is the biggest contributor to wealth and wealth transfer between generations. History shows us that black home ownership has been stifled at every turn. Black land theft allows people to see that African Americans falling behind financially is not because they don't try, but because every time they had a chance to get ahead, laws, rules, regulations, and those with power use the system to bend the rules to take from them. When it comes to black land theft, it wasn't just government institutions. It was white people who had the money and knew the laws they could use to swindle African-American landowners. The rules and laws in place allowed white people to use government rules and institutions to not only steal land, but enrich themselves once they got a hold of it. And because this massive theft was accomplished through thousands of small transactions over decades, it was easy for the rest of us to look the other way. Black land theft today isn't as prevalent and blatant, and new wealth extraction schemes have gained prominence. But what the story of black land theft in the 20th century tells us is that if no one is asking questions about what thousands of small financial transactions add up to in a nation that was founded on slavery, then we are positioning ourselves, by design or not, to miss the next wealth extraction schemes for decades as well. In a country where the typical white family still has eight times the wealth of the typical black family, and the racial wealth divide is getting worse, we can't afford not to ask these questions. Black land theft happened from the 20th century to the 21st century, 
and it had major impacts on the lives of African-American landowners and their descendants. We don't know what life would be like if all that land hadn't been stolen, but African-Americans' financial futures might have looked very different. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.